Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, and let's get let's get started. All right. I think uh, the public hearing is number one. Correct. Okay, Madam Secretary. Okay. Okay, Madam Secretary, if you'll call the first item, I think that's the public hearing. Under the except, I'm, I'm sorry, item one is a hearing. Okay, item one is a hearing, and um, I don't have anyone signed up. We have no, no speakers. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak on item one, which is the public hearing um, pertaining to, what is it pertaining to? Okay, it's the public, the public hearing of no objection on the 4% housing tax credit application of the Houston Lease Housing Associate Owner uh, Number Eight, you know, which is in Council Member uh, Evan Shabazz District. Is there anyone who wishes to testify on for or against? Okay, nine. Is there a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Second. So moved a second to close the hearing. Any objection? Chair is now in the hearing, and the motion is granted. Okay. With respect to the mass report, there are a few things. Once I once I finish. Uh, uh, making these comments. I'm going to ask Dr. Purse if he would just come and make some remarks in reference to kind of like a, a brief status report. And if you have any questions to Dr. Purse in terms of where things are, what's happening, I thought that would, um, would be good, at least at this point, uh, for him to come. So um, let me just say that today, from 12 to 3, today, the city of
thousand. Houston uh, accounts for eleven of those thirteen thousand. And so uh, just want to encourage people to keep doing what they are doing. And then the numbers uh, may seem alarming, alarming overall, uh, but a new report from the Kinder Institute shows social distancing uh, is working. And based on their study, 4,533 lives have been saved throughout Harris County because of the stay home work safe order. Um, and the Kinder Institute also estimates, uh, estimates show that social distancing measures during the 14 day period between March 24th and April 6th prevented deaths and hospitalizations. Um, so it's critical that we continue to be vigilant and especially, especially uh, this week. We, uh, we will, people will be celebrating for the Jewish community Passover. And so that will be starting this week. And then for Christians, it will be Easter uh, and a lot of activities, a lot of celebrations and things of that nature will take place uh, this week. And so, um, but uh, encouraging people to maintain their social distancing and to uh, continue to focus on uh, stay home and be safe. So uh, certainly would appreciate all of that. With respect to our parks, uh, we're keeping our parks open, but I uh, made it very clear to, to our park rangers that if they get, too, if they get crowded, where well, people can't engage in social distancing, the rangers have the authority to shut those parks down. So, uh, and so just don't want anybody to be offended, uh, but the parks are open. So if you go to a park and it's crowded, go to another one. And if you go to that one and it's crowded, uh, then go to another one or simply go to your neighborhood and walk around or jog in the neighborhood. But, uh, but we're being very intentional in the month of April. Um, a reminder that on Monday, we launched a resource for a city county and private sector essential employees who need to find child care while they continue to work. And this is a project created by the city. We partnered with the city, with the county as well, uh, and partnered with the Collaborative for Children and Workforce Solutions. And so uh, uh, the program that's put, put in place will be able to provide child care for about 3,500 kids. It's the first of its kind of in, in the country. Workforce Solutions is, is a is putting in about $10 million in order to provide financial assistance for those parents who may need it. And um, you can go to the website at findchildcarenow.org. That's findchildcarenow, that's with a capital N, uh, to complete uh, the online registration forms. <coughs> and then to, uh, to, on Thursday, the day of prayer, uh, and again, uh, uh, this was an idea put forth by Council Member of uh, Pollock, it's a day of prayer or silent meditation. It's non-denominational. And so wherever you are at noon, wherever you are at noon, just pause. And uh, please say, uh, uh, put forth a prayer for our city, for our state, our country, quite frankly, for just humanity and as a whole, or just a moment of silent meditation. That's tomorrow at noon, wherever you are, just for a moment. And that would be appreciated. And then on Thursday, Houston Sports and Civic Facilities are uniting for the Hashtag light it blue campaign. The sports stadium, civic venue, venues, and iconic buildings will turn blue in support of all of our health <coughs> healthcare professionals and other essential personnel on the front line. And those are municipal workers, police officers, firefighters, healthcare workers, grocery stores workers, and, and you name it, the, all that are essential. And that will be on Thursday. City Hall. Highway 59 Bridges, Georgia Brown Convention Center, BBVA Stadium, NRG Stadium, Minute Maid Park, Toyota Center, Georgia Brown Convention Center will all be lit blue from 8 to 9 p.m. on Thursday night. Uh, that will, uh, Councilmember Mr. Vaz. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor, uh, for that report. And I just wanted to talk about something very quickly that has become a concern for me. I, uh, my next door neighbor is handicapped and I am finding that her caregiver and other caregivers are not being provided with PPE. And that's a real concern because some of them go to several locations. Some of them ride the city bus. And so I don't know if it's anything that we can do uh, because it's a real concern when you walk in and they don't have on the proper equipment. The people are already 
you know, uh, disabled or uh, fragile. And so I don't know if there's something that the city can do to address that. You know, we're working on that. Uh, let me reach out to Gabe Caceres, who's over the mayor's office for people with disabilities. I know he's very sensitive to that and see if we can assist in, in uh, providing various supplies, that numbers of, of let's say, masks. Yeah, because they're, they're, the lady told me that they have to buy it themselves. They're already not making a lot. So I think if the agencies would provide that for them, that would be great. And it can't, you know, it can't be something that they can be given and go from person to person to person. It has to be per patient. These are people that are working for agencies that you're speaking of? Yeah, they work for the agencies. Okay. And the agencies uh, are not providing the equipment, and they're being told that they have to purchase it themselves, which, of course, we know is limited supply already. And so if they would take that upon themselves. And, and one other thing, I don't know how other council members feel about it, and I've kind of asked around, but is there any way that we, if we choose to be, that we could be tested. Uh, you know, maybe a mobile unit or something could come and, and test us if we choose to be tested. Only if, only if you're having symptoms. Okay. Yep. <coughs> <coughs> no, I don't think that. No, I'm, I'm really kidding. I'm yeah. kidding. But anyway, nothing, nothing to kid about, right. though, seriously. Uh, okay, and then as the NAACP education chair, I get a lot of, lot of, uh, people that are concerned about how we're educating our kids, but of course we know that's not the, the city's venue, but I'm going to work with uh, Council Member Cisneros on some things to see what we can do as a city. Excellent. Thank you, Mayor. Sir. Dr. Purse, why don't you come forward and provide us with some, some uh, brief remarks, and if the Council Members have any questions, uh, this will be a good time for them to address them to you. You'll turn that mic on, Dr. Purse. And I think all of you are familiar with Dr. David Purse, the medical director for the city of Houston. Good morning, Mayor, and, thank, and uh, Council Mayor, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, so the mayor has given you already some of the, the numbers which we are uh, tabulating daily uh, for the city of Houston. We currently, as of last evening, there's 1,145 known cases of individuals that are infected with COVID-19, the virus that causes COVID-19. And among those, there are 11 deaths. So, Mayor, we do have a breakdown that you had asked for uh, based on ethnicity. Uh, we just got this, and so of those 11, seven are African American, two are Latino, and two are Caucasian. Uh, in terms of age breakdown, five were between the ages of 60 and 69, four were between the ages of 70 and 79, uh, one in their 40s and one in their 30s. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the tabulation and the, the demographics of that. Um, I, I, I'm sure this has been front and center in everyone's mind, and so I could talk a lot about a lot of things here, but I suspect we'd rather we just got right to the questions. And so, Doctor, uh, when uh, somebody gets co uh, how many people have? We're not reporting how many people are uh, have survived it. In other words, have, have have made it through. And that report that we're getting every day, I'm I'm being asked. Uh, can, can you have have a record of how many are are have, have made it through it? Yeah, so that's uh, difficult to do. In fact, it's impossible to do, quite honestly, because there are two ways for someone to be recognized having uh, recovered. Uh, one is the way that made a lot of national attention with the case in San Antonio, where an individual is clear of their symptoms and they get tested, <clears throat> and they have to have two negative tests at least 24 hours apart. Now that is not being done uh, routinely anymore because it consumes two more tests, which are precious, and we really need to be using those to try to identify new cases. The other way is if someone has no fever without any sort of you know, fever-reducing agents, so no Tylenol, no ibuprofen, no fever for three days, and during that three days their symptoms, if they have any continued respiratory symptoms, they need to be improving. And then on that last day, that has to be at least seven days from the first symptom. That's the way probably 99% of folks are being recognized as having recovered. And that's not being recorded anywhere. Uh, so un unfortunately, there's no way to really be able to document accurately the number that are recovered. We do get from, uh, we're starting to get from the hospitals the number of folks who they have discharged, but that's a tiny fraction of the question that you ask. And so uh, that's really not a useful piece of information. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Purse. And uh, I continually to be amazed at the job you do each and every day. Um, you. you do a tremendous job. Uh, you're very good with your information, and you give the information as because everybody can understand it. So I appreciate that. 
Uh, a question, of the 11 deaths, I think all of them had uh, underlying conditions, is that correct? correct? That First is question. correct. All of them had other, and sometimes very serious underlying illnesses. It, yes, and then the second part is, how do we know when we get over that hump and when we start having the ability to get back to some sense of normalcy? Is there any indicators that you guys are looking for in the medical field? That's a complicated question. Um, certainly when the number of new cases uh, comes in that starts to level off um, and, and start reduce the number of new cases starts, starts, starts dropping. And, and, I, and I have to uh, frame that a little bit because Houston is a city of 2.2 million people. And so the number of cases that we know of is really small compared to the entire population. And that's because we don't have quite enough testing, not quite enough, we don't have anywhere near enough testing to be able to monitor that as closely as we'd like to. But nevertheless, with the testing that we have available, when we see the numbers starting to, to, to flatten. Now, the, the other complicating part of that is the reason those numbers are flattening, or when they flatten, the reason they will be flattening is because we're all doing all the things that we're doing now. And so what we have yet to know is as you start taking your foot off the brakes, if you will, you know, how, how quickly can you do that? What is the right way to do that? These are gonna be really difficult decisions. Right now, I think we need to pay a lot of attention to what's going on in Wuhan, because they're starting to take their foot off the brake and we need to pay careful attention to what works and what doesn't work there, as well as when New York City gets to that point. We're probably two, three weeks behind New York City. So we need to pay close attention to what other cities are doing in order to, to try to answer your question. Councilman Evan Shabazz. Thank you again, Mayor. Thank you, Dr. Perth, for the wonderful job that you're doing. I just have a quick question, and, and I also wanna let everybody, I'm not, wasn't trying to belittle with my question and this is really not a, a joking matter, so I'm gonna put myself in my, in my place. But certainly, I wanna ask you, there are a disproportionate amount of African Americans being diagnosed throughout the country, and I wanna know if those statistics bear up in, in Harris County and Houston as well, in terms of the uh, disproportionate amount of African Americans that are being diagnosed. So um, <clears throat> we got to be. I just want to be a little bit careful about the terms we use in terms of, of uh, diagnosed, because diagnosed, if you mean has a test that's positive, as opposed to being admitted to a hospital or suffering serious consequences. Well, I mean, if you want to break it down like that, that would be fine. But I'm, I'm just yeah. really concerned because of the right. the nationwide uh, right. reporting of the disproportionate amount of African Americans. So theoretically, none of us have any immunity to this virus. Therefore, all of us, regardless of our ethnicity, should, should be at equal risk of having contracted the virus. <clears throat> then the number that get diagnosed is dependent on who has access to getting a test, right? And so we, we, we know that there are social disparities in healthcare. And so that is gonna play a factor in that, making that reporting. But more importantly, and I think more to your point, I'm, I'm making an assumption here, so correct me if I'm wrong, more to your point is that there's a disproportionate number of African Americans who seem to be suffering the worst consequences of the virus. And uh, that does in fact appear to be the case. And I suspect that from a, uh, I'm gonna answer from a medical scientific standpoint, and I'm gonna answer from a social standpoint. From a medical scientific standpoint, the risk factors that people of any ethnicity can have that put them at highest risk is hypertension and diabetes and heart disease. And the African-American population, unfortunately, has a greater preponderance of that than other ethnicities. And then the other part is the, the social disparities that this country has struggled with for decades. And those are playing a part in it as well. And you know, it has always been our position that the social disparities in healthcare are completely unacceptable. And as a nation, we've got to do something to, to address that. Because here's an, oppor not an opportunity, here's, a, here's the consequence of those decades of disparities that are coming to play and impacting people's lives that really should never have occurred. Thank you. Councilmember Travis. Thank you, Mayor. Dr. Purse, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm always concerned about the data and the facts, and so um, I, I want to give you an actual anecdotal story about somebody that we all know. I won't mention his name, uh, but his story sort of causes me some concern as if we're getting all the information, and I would then like you to address that and see how we do a better job of it. And here's the issue. Um, this gentleman, uh, went in for testing on a Thursday, found out he had coronavirus on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. They gave him the test results back, and uh, his doctor told him there was no, nothing to do, just stay home, uh, drink plenty of liquids, get plenty of sleep. Uh, and he said, should my daughter and my wife, uh, his daughter was home from college, should they be tested? He said, no, just assume they already have it. And so self-quarantined with them. And so he self-quarantined not for 14 days, but 17 days. 
He said, I feel better, everything's fine. Uh, they didn't go back and test him to see if he's still got it. I don't know if there's a test for that to see if your antibodies are there. They just said, after you've self-quarantined, you're fine. Mm -hmm. And just assume your wife and your daughter are as well. Now, here's my concern. We know we have a confirmed case of coronavirus, one case. But are we counting this as three cases because the, the daughter and the wife quarantined? And if we're not, why aren't we? And if we are, why are we? Because I would like to see them tested. I and mean, here's why I'd like to see them tested. Yeah. If they're tested now and we find out they did have it, then we know we have three confirmed cases, not one. Right. But if they're tested and they don't have it, then that says something about the infectiousness of the disease if they've been with them for 17 days and didn't catch it. Right. And this is all the data and all the information I'd like to know, but this individual's example to me told me some of the flaws and problems we're having. And I'm just wondering if you could address some of those. Because last night I was listening to Dr. Deborah Burks Mm -hmm. who said that if anybody dies with coronavirus, assume that it's from coronavirus. And mm -hmm. I'm like, well, there's a difference between from and with. I've got diabetes. If I get in a car accident today, I died from the car accident, not because of diabetes. Right. Right. So anyway, if you can address those so we can make sure that we're getting all the proper data. Yeah, yeah. All right, so a couple of points. Uh, to your first point, that uh, we are currently only t uh, counting those people who have a confirmed test. test. So the family members in your example are likely or high likely to uh, have contracted. And when this all began, we were under the belief that this virus was going to behave like viruses tend to, where um, if you contract it, you develop symptoms. And so in that case, if the family members developed symptoms, they would have been advised to get tested. What we've learned about this virus that is different from most every other virus is the really high proportion of people who are infected and have little or no symptoms. And so in a more perfect world, we would at some point test those family members to see if they had contracted it. But we simply don't have the amount of testing uh, depth to be able to do that. To your next point, which is a good one, and, and I'm glad you bring it up, is there is uh, actually on the market today, there, it's just hitting the market now, there are tests available to see if you had the infection. Okay. They test for immunoglobulins. The problem that I see, and I'm going to be a little cynical for a moment, so bear with me, I'm very frustrated with the salespeople of those devices because they're promoting them as a way to determine if somebody has the illness. And what it tests for is your the immunoglobulins, your immune system's reaction to the virus. And that takes several days. The best reports I've seen, I've seen, I've read many, not, I shouldn't say many, there aren't many, but of the ones that I found in the medical peer-reviewed scientific journals is that the this immune reaction begins, it appears about four days at the earliest after infection. I've seen as late as nine and 10 days. But even at the earliest, and not only that, but then it, it, it has to get to a level where you'll test and you'll find it, right? So there's a several day lag between when somebody is infected and when this test will show that they had it. Um, and in addition, it tests for two parts of your immune system, and if both of them were positive, then you're probably past the illness. So that will be useful in the future in determining who had the illness, or who had the infection, but not who has the infection. Well, and, I, and I'm glad you brought that up because there's a lot of people out there on social media uh, who are saying they felt they had these type of symptoms back in February. I'm actually one of those people. I thought I actually, uh, the symptoms that came up, I experienced back in February, so did my fiance. Right. It, we thought it was a cold. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, and, and of course, the common cold is a coronavirus, but it's not the 19. Right. And, and not only that, but the test I talk about will turn positive if you had the common cold as well. Will it? Yeah. Okay, so it could be a false positive for coronavirus 19 then. Right. It, it, the test ah. tests for coronavirus Period. immunity not necessarily COVID-19. Oh, well then how, how is that going to be helpful to us? Well, it may be helpful because, and again, this is part of the research that's being done, is we don't know how long you maintain the immunity to the coronaviruses. It's okay. theorized that it may be um, uh, less than a year, but we don't know. We constantly, we don't know. And, and every virus is this, if this virus has taught us anything, it's that every virus has its own set of characteristics. Even if it's in the family of coronaviruses, you can't trust it to behave because of the viruses, the coronaviruses infect humans, four of them cause the common cold. The other two are SARS and MERS, which are yeah. highly deadly. So, and, you know, here's this, this, this one, which, you know, has the characteristics of being easily transmitted like the common cold, but also having a, a frighteningly high case fatality rate. Will, so. will there be a test that will test whether you had coronavirus 19? Yeah. And the reason I say that is it'd be interesting to know of those who had it and didn't know they had it, yeah. so we could really understand the totality of the environment in which we find ourselves. Because yeah. when we look at that, then we're either going to figure out that it's either more highly infectious than we thought, or it's less deadly than we 
thought. You're right. Uh, yeah. And both of those are going to be good things to know, which we don't know right now. You're exactly right. Welcome okay. to my world. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Dr. Purse, for everything that you're doing. Um, I think the last stat that I heard um, was that the hospitals are about 60% full. Is that the case? And then also, can we get a baseline on, on a normal day without coronavirus? What percentage um, capacity is the, or the hospitals normally in? I'm going to turn you to the microphone. Yes, I'm thank you. you. Okay. Uh, so the question, it, it, the hospitals right now, uh, and we're, we're measuring this in a variety of different ways. And, and the mayor and Dr. Uh, knows Dr. If you bring that back, and I'll get that. The, um, the hospitals, we're measuring the hospitals uh, through an entity called SETRAC, which uh, covers 25 counties, and we're getting hospital data from them uh, on a county-by-county -county basis. And then the Texas Medical Center is also um, gathering data. About the Texas Medical Center data, we think Texas Medical Center, everybody thinks of that complex down the street. Their data is really all of those member institutions, their systems. So it's the Memorial Hermann system, all of their hospitals, the Houston Methodist system, all of their hospitals. So their data really covers a nine county region. The bottom line is when we look at all of these, we're finding that hospitals are running in the 50 to 70 percent occupancy rate right now because the hospitals have been very aggressive in creating space for the surge that we are all afraid is going to happen. And uh, so they've created quite a bit of, of capacity that way. Uh, your other part of the question was what is it normally like? Well, everyone in this room knows that every January, all the hospitals wind up going on diversion because they are 100% full during flu, uh, flu season. And so hospitals generally operate at greater, greater than 90% occupancy. Uh, even in the summer during flu season, they bump up against 100%. And right now, I think that's uh, the reason I point that out is the dramatic job the hospitals have done in creating capacity uh, in case we get hit with a, a bad wave. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, Councilmember Kangman. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, this has been extremely helpful, and I really appreciate Dr. Purse being here so that we can get all of our questions answered uh, around the horseshoe, so thank you for that. And Dr. Purse, um, we know how you're just world class. Uh, thank you for your leadership alongside the mayors in this and everything that you've been doing from your knowledge base everything you're juggling as well as your compassion and when you were speaking with um, council member Evan Shabazz uh, and addressing a lot of the health care disparities that we are facing and that this virus is spotlighting uh, just to go back to what you were saying on that for a minute do you mind because I was trying to look for a pen going back through the racial breakdown of the deaths in the city of Houston really hmm. quickly and then I have a follow-up question sure based on um, there are 11 deaths. Yep. Seven of them are African American, two are Latino, and two are uh, white or Caucasian. Okay. And um, have we looked at? Uh, uh, we all know that this is, uh, in terms of death and serious underlying illness, uh, impacting the African American communities. Are we also looking at with those seven deaths if those came from uh, particular? areas in the city and uh, again that there may be reflective of low income areas and are we concentrating additional resources in those areas to make sure that we are drawing attention to that yeah another really good and really complicated question so when we look today we've got you know the 1100 um, cases and so we need to look at that if you look at the 11 deaths it's not enough information that you can draw anything from and um, so if we look at the 1,100 cases, we're starting to, to generate heat maps. We've, we've been reluctant to do that before because what happens when we've done this before is that you'll find, uh, particularly with the communicable infectious disease, you'll find that in the beginning certain neighborhoods appear to have a greater incidence of cases than in others. The problem that creates is that the f people that are in the areas that have the, the low cases, they think, oh, we're good and they drop their guard and they stop doing the things that we ask them to do to, to protect themselves. When the reality is it's just, it's, a, it's, a, it's one frame out of the movie. And at that day, that's where the, where the, how the heat map looked. But four or five days later, it's, I can guarantee you it's gonna look different. And so that's part of the problem. But now that we've got 1,100 cases, we're probably at the point where we can start doing heat maps. And, um, and even with that, wh whatever that shows, that's gonna show higher concentration of cases in some areas and lesser in others. And to the point of do we need to put more effort into those where it's high? Yes. But the flip of that is, is the areas that have lesser density absolutely cannot drop their guard. That, that's the downside. Yeah. 
And I will tell you, we've had that conversations with the uh, hospitals um, as late as yesterday. Um, but we are going to be putting together these heat maps, uh, which will give us the opportunity uh, to be able to kind of target our strategies in certain areas. Um, it'll provide us with more information. And now that we are up to, as Dr. First said, over 1,100 cases, uh, I think for, um, for those of us who are having to make decisions on a daily basis, uh, it will be more instructive in just knowing where those cases are. And I think it will help to provide people additional information in their respective quadrants uh, that they um, uh, should, t should factor in their behavior and their patterns. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Robinson. Thank you, Mayor. And Dr. Purse, thank you for being here. I'd like to echo my colleagues who have uh, spoken in appreciation of your expertise. And Mayor, I do feel we're, we're blessed not only to have Dr. Purse, but of course the Texas Medical Center and the great uh, institutions we have here. In that regard, I think I'd like to follow up first on my colleagues who are talking about a variety of tests, whether it's the one to determine whether you have the virus or perhaps those that, have, uh, that test to see if you've had it. Mm -hmm. And to pick up a little bit on that point in particular, the, the sense that those who have had the virus might be of special value to those to provide That's immunity, right. the virology that we hear about, the antivirus and the things that we can do, and understanding that we are at the cutting edge of a lot of the science with Dr. Hotez and others in the TMC, um, you know, I'm, I'm appreciative of the science and where we are on the edge of this. I'm also very much alert and aware, and thank you, Mayor, again, for being on the front line of this, but having shared with me this weekend that there are ongoing negotiations that go south at the last minute and uh, sometimes challenge us as a city when we're procuring PPE. Um, you know, we're all now lucky to have the masks that we have as provided by the city. A very limited number, I assure you, and those things that we can't distribute at large, but other things that we've seen through the global community and elsewhere in our region that would be good if we could do it at a larger scale. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think I appreciate the points that have been made about not being able to test everyone if they're not experiencing the symptoms. But I, I'm also on the receiving end of a number of solicitations, all good intentions. Mm -hmm. But healthcare experts, as you know, some that I've spoken with you about, and others who are trying to do the right thing. But right now, I guess it is a, it's one more question about testing, about what's at our current disposal, and if there is a special category in particular about those who believe they may have been infected for the plasma or other things that could be harvested from that. Okay, so I'm, I'm hearing two questions. We'll talk about the plasma infusion or transfusion first. So the, um, when your body is infected with a bacteria or a virus, it's, the immune system responds by creating what's called immunoglobulins. And that's, in fact, one of the tests that we're going to talk about in a minute, test for the immunoglobulins. That's your immune system's response. And um, you may have heard my analogy the other day with the M&Ms and, uh, and, and how a virus is like an M&M. So when your body sees, yeah. learns, when your immune system learns about something new that's not supposed to be there, it creates these immunoglobulins. And so think of those like red flags. And they, the, a certain type of white blood cell will produce these immunoglobulins that will then go and put a flag on that thing which is not supposed to be in your body. And then other parts of your immune system come and destroy that. All right? So these immunoglobulins are, are your body has to learn the, the, the pathogen to then start developing the immunoglobulins or the red flags. And that's why it... It's, that when you get sick with the virus, that's why you're, you're sick. When you get the cold, it's because your body is learning what's not supposed to be there and mounting the defenses. But in the meantime, you feel miserable, right? So when you give a vaccine to someone, your body then learns so that then when you actually get infected, the immune system already jumps on it and eliminates it. You never even know you, got, you were infected, right? Now, those immunoglobulins we're talking about. And so with people who have recovered, their body has uh, lots of those immunoglobulins. And so the thought is if we can harvest those from people who have recovered, we can then potentially give those to folks who are acutely and seriously ill to jumpstart uh, their immune system to, uh, to, to, to fight the, not to jumpstart, but rather to assist their immune system in uh, combating uh, the virus. That is extremely complicated. And um, uh, there's a lot of work. One of the greatest blessings about Houston is the Texas Medical Center, where a lot of this research is ongoing. 
And uh, hopefully we're going to see a lot more of that in the future. But that is, as you pointed out, as you carried out, it's cutting edge. The concept isn't cutting edge, but doing it uh, with this particular virus and in a large scale uh, is cutting edge. And then your other question about the, um, uh, the tests, I believe, and, and the number of folks who are coming. And I think with any test, one of the things I was taught in medical school, if you're going to order a test, you need to know two things. One, why are you really ordering that test? What is the question you're trying to answer? <clears throat> and two, are you prepared to deal with the results? Okay. So with the immunoglobulin tests, uh, I, I th and as I said earlier, they test for whether or not you've got immunoglobulins in your system, so your right. immune system is reacting to it, and there's a little mm -hmm. bit of a lag there. And with this virus in particular, with the asymptomatic and the pre-symptomatic spread, one of the characteristics of this virus is it appears that bodies produce a tremendous amount of virus at or before you develop symptoms, even for those folks who develop symptoms. That's the most critical time to identify somebody as being infected. And so we're in the, to some degree, we're in the worst place right now because if you, even if you get the right test to identify the virus, it's taking days until you get the answer. So that's hugely problematic. And then uh, the immunoglobulin test will, will, will um, identify that you had the virus, but not for several days. And so we don't Very you know, quick follow up on that. So if that is a huge problem, what are we doing about it? The time lapse, is that something we are simply suffering as a city? Well, what, what yeah, it we depends on which. It? So it depends on which lab that you're using. For example, there are some labs in the Texas Medical Center that hospitals are using, which, because it's their lab and they're at maximum capacity, but they're getting their answers within about 24 hours. Uh, the FEMA sites are using the big commercial labs in the United States, the huge, huge labs, mm -hmm. and they started off with about a, a four-day turnaround. Then it got out to about eight days, and now it's coming back down to four days. And as as the volume of testing catches up with the number of samples being submitted, we'll see those days come down. Uh, and, and they are starting to come down. The, the turnaround is, is starting to get better. Okay. But, uh, but you can see with the timeline, if you get sick, you get the symptoms, you know, I mean, we're, we're really in a race against the clock. Thank you, Doc. Uh, Council Member Cisneros. Uh, thank you, um, Mayor, and thank you, Dr. Peirce. The daily briefings have been so helpful, you know, in, in communicating the, um, what, what flattening the curve means. Um, you speak about it daily and, and in different ways, and I think it's helping, you know, the public to understand. Um, there are still, I, I mean, last night, I, it, it, um, yesterday evening, and it was dusk, I saw a very large soccer game happening at a park. I called. Um, I sent a text message to um, Chief Acevedo and asked him if he could send a patrol over to to talk to those guys. And they were they were just like that. They were there. I saw the flashing lights, and they, I saw the, the officers talking to them, and the and the young men left. But but we're not reaching everybody. You know, the daily briefings are good. You know, and there's a lot of social media. But there's there are people that 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 aren't really embracing the message. I think they, you know, these were all young men, and there was you know maybe 25 of them out there that were playing. So. I think you know that, that, that to the extent that we can um, to, you know, to really attack communications and maybe even you know a, a more aggressive way I, I'm not sure how but maybe there's you know we get our media partners to you know to to help us you know to, to reach at deeper levels you know and really you know to, to spread the word it's important so I think that a lot of people are understanding flattening the curve you know and that that's about social distancing and wearing masks and self quarantining. But there's, in the last um, day, I've, I've started hearing an, another one that, that refers to that, you know, the graph of, of raising the line or raising the bar. And I, and I understand what that means. It's, it's really what we're doing right now with, um, you know, uh, trying to increase the healthcare system's capacity. You know, and so today at Minute Maid Park, you know, those donations, that's exactly what that's doing. Um, you know, we're, we're asking for cash donations to buy PP equipment. But um, my question to you is, do you think we ought to also talk about that in addition to flattening the curve? Should we say raising the line or raising the bar? Or is that going to confuse people? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, as you've noticed, I've tried to give my explanations of some complicated processes and terms that you know, people can understand. That, that, and, and in spite of that, I, I, still, I still hear people saying, I, I want to get tested so that I won't get the virus. And I, I don't know how many times I've said that standing next to the mayor at the podium, that the, the, the test doesn't protect you from it, but nevertheless. So educating the, pu the public is challenging, as I think everyone here knows. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, we do our best job, and not everyone is going to get or understand the message. But the more we can do to make it um, uh, at, at a uh, complexity that people can handle, and I also believe that we need to, you know, 
uh, feed people information, you know, in bite-sized bits at a time because it's complicated to process. So to your question about the hospital capacity, well, what we can say is that the, uh, we, we talk about plan A, B, and C. And, and so plan A is hospitals operating within their current standard usual capacity. And this is important in that you can see how they've created capacity. And the best place for a patient to be treated, if possible, is in a hospital that is routinely used as a hospital by people who routinely work in that hospital. So that's plan A. And we've got uh, quite a bit of capacity uh, availability, I should say, there. Um, if that should max out, hospitals e and each hospital and each hospital system are working on slightly different contingency plans because their, their situation is different, their business model is different, their physical plants are different. But every single one of them is working on how to expand should they get past their, their standard. And so um, uh, that's plan B. And then plan C is the thing like we're seeing in New York City with the Javits Center and, um, and other things. And so those plans are, are, are being discussed as well and moving forward. Um, uh, you know, hopefully we won't get there because that's not an ideal place to take care of a patient. But if our backs are against the wall, uh, we may have to go there. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Plummer. Yes, thank you. Dr. Purse, just thank you, thank you for what, for what you've done. Um, quick question, two quick questions. And I know that a lot of this is kind of for, in the formative, um, but just want to ask you a couple of directives. I know that Abbott's, the Abbott Lab uh, has come up with a more of a rapid test, so to speak. Kind of where are we with that? Um, how are we able to attain it if, we, if we're able to put our hands on it? And then how are we going to implement that into the process? And then number two, we're talking about the hotels um, and allowing our, um, our residents to go there. Are those hotels going to be used for COVID positives? If they are, how are we ensuring that, um, what are we doing? I know, we, I know you have everything in place in terms of sanitation and making sure that we're doing that the right way, but just to make our residents feel comfortable. Can you talk a little bit about that? And I know it's all formative, sure. but can you advise us a little bit of how that's looking? Sure, what was, I'm sorry, what was the first part of the question? The first one was the rapid test. The rapid that's, test that's, right. that's, that's coming on the market now. Right. Um, I think that's gonna help a lot with patients that are positive and maybe even kind of allowing them to test out right. um, so we can make our communities feel about a lot safer. Yeah. So and Abbott you, Labs, Mayor. one of the, I'm sorry, um, Abbott Labs, one of the largest lab uh, uh, makers in the world, uh, has come out with a device, a, a lab test, it's a, called a point of care test that will in fact test for the virus, similar to what our lab is doing now. And it has about a 15 minute turnaround, which is really helpful. The problem with it, if there is a problem with it, is that it can only do one sample at a time. Whereas our lab, for example, our city lab and the commercial labs, they're doing hundreds of samples at the same time. Now that process takes about, takes an hour to two hours to prepare the sample and then it actually runs in the test for about four hours. Uh, but they can do many at the same time. So this Abbott test is a point of care test. So it would be ideal for doctor's offices or clinics uh, because they, they can do it, they get the answer in 15 minutes, but it, you can only do one at a time. So the Abbott Labs has produced a number of these and they're distributing in my understanding. Um, I've not seen this in an official document, but I've seen it in plenty of emails that they are being sent predominantly to state labs. So in Austin, we should get, uh, they should get some, and then it'll be up to the state to turn around and decide how to distribute those across the state. And so we don't have that answer yet. Um, but again, it's, you know, there's a, there's a, a plus and a minus to that. And your second question about the um, hotel situation. So yes, that would be for people who we know are infected, they are COVID positive but they don't have anywhere to go for they don't have a, they don't have a secure place to go uh, while they uh, convalesce to make sure they don't spread the virus to anyone else and that is a a, a joint effort between the city and the county and uh, the wraparound services are being taken care of by the county and uh, the city is responsible and has been res and successfully responsible for getting the locations okay. uh, council member kubash earlier <clears throat> dr first earlier you commented about the false, uh, the false positives that this uh, corona, uh, COVID-19 is a coronavirus. So uh, how reliable is it that we know that it's COVID-19 that someone has when we test them? Yeah. So I anticipate that the, um, that the lab world is going to come up with something that's specific for COVID-19. The ones I've seen so far um, are are specific for coronavirus, but clearly there's a need for something to be specific for COVID-19. So I expect that that's coming. The ones that are on the market today, I have yet to see uh, one that is specific for COVID-19. So, so it's not actually telling us if it's COVID-19 well, or not. So, so again, a complicated situation. So when you have a population of, of people, 
where the virus is spreading like this one is, and should the test come back positive, there's a high likelihood that it's COVID-19 because that's the virus that's impacting the community at that time. But the regular cold is out there too. So in Councilmember Travis's example, where he had a cold even four months ago, there's a chance that he would test positive because of the cold he had four months ago. So there's, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a little bit of a guess looking at you know what virus is most prevalent in the society at the time that you do this testing. So so the antibodies that my body builds up on that coronavirus will not help me on the COVID-19 virus. No, unfortunately they won't. Thank you. Vice Mayor Pro Tem, Castac Tatum. Thank you, Mayor. Dr. Purse, I, I really want to let you know how much I appreciate your pragmatic approach to explaining this pandemic and all of the work that you have done um, with everyone. The, the updates on a daily basis have been comforting as well as educational. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, we, you gave us the breakdown based on age and um, ethnicity. Is there a breakdown based on gender? Uh, is yeah. what my first question and then the second question is can you talk about if someone is uh, testing positive and they get the results what instruction is given to that person when they are sent home to quarantine yeah uh, so your first question uh, the gender breakdown and we, we do have that I don't have it written in front of me okay I would, I would assume it's somewhat close to 50 50 um, we don't see a big gender difference here in the United States uh, there was a big gender difference in China, which got a lot of international attention, but we believe that's because in China and that society, that part of China, and I've never been there, so I'm being told this, is that uh, it is socially acceptable for men to smoke, but not for women. And so there was a greater percentage of male deaths, which may have been really related to the greater prevalence of, of cigarette smoke. But in the United States, it appears to be 50-50. These numbers are small. I expect mm -hmm. they'll be somewhere near 50-50. Your second question was, when someone tests positive but they're not sick enough to be admitted to a hospital, what are they being told? And so what we're telling people is that they need to understand that they are potentially very contagious to anyone around them. And so they, what I would recommend by is people go and they you know, go home and it's uh, no person-to-person -person contact. And that means, I, why the picture I try to draw is you go to your bedroom and if you generally sleep with your spouse, either you go to another room or your spouse goes to another room, but you don't sleep together uh, throughout this. Somebody will bring you food on a paper plate with a plastic fork and a paper cup and knock on your door and leave it outside. You wait a minute, you go, you get your food, you eat it, you then take the paper products and you put them in a trash bag and every two, three days you put the trash bag outside and somebody comes along with another trash bag, folds it back to cover their hands and they cover up that trash bag and they take it out. No person to person contact. And that is very difficult. Um, uh, uh, you know, so whether, you know, we're doing this with both the patients that you described, the individuals who are tested positive, and if they're having symptoms, again, it goes back to the rule we talked about before with three days of no fever, improving respiratory symptoms, and that has to be at least seven days in the first day of symptoms. Um, or the same rules apply for somebody who is on uh, quarantine. So remember, quarantine is not a case. Quarantine is somebody, so for example, in the situation you gave of, the, of a, of we'll say it's a spouse who tested positive and has symptoms. So you know what, their, their spouse is a close contact and they would be asked to quarantine while this person is asked to isolate. And so you can quickly see the problems it creates in terms of who's feeding who, <laughs> right? And how we, how we not, not do, because the, the assumption is that the, the one that is infected, we know is infected, but the other one is possibly not infected. So the thing is, you don't want the virus going from this person to that person. So this is the one who needs to prepare the food because if they are infected, well, they can't reinfect the first one. But this one can't prepare that one's food because they definitely will infect the, their spouse. So, it, you know, again, a lot of coaching. But what about um, any any medical advice as far as um, Tylenol? And if, if people have symptoms but they are quarantining at home, yeah. um, is there something that they can do? I know there's not a vaccine, um, but is there right. something that people can do if they are experiencing pain, fever? What right. would you, is there something we can recommend? Yeah, so certainly if you're uh, feeling uncomfortable, just like with any illness, you know, go ahead and take the, 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 the Tylenol and um, stay hydrated is important, especially if you're having fever. There have some, been some reports about, uh, which um, I don't think are founded about problems with uh, ibuprofen and so at this point there's nothing to scientifically back that up let me just say if you if, unless you're a camera person if you could take your seat please 
So, so consider that to be rumor at this point. But in the meantime, people need to stay hydrated and if they want to take a fever reducing agent, um, that's totally fine. Thank you. Well, Councilman Travis. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Dr. Purse, I want to go back to the data again a little bit. And I want to talk to you about two, basically two items. HIPAA is one of those items. And I would like to know um, how that affects the data that we're collecting and able to share with others. And if there's, if there's an effect, uh, and there may not be, but um, I just want to know how we're able to use that data. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also talk about the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, IHME, uh, which seems to be the national model. Uh, and I understand there are uh, regional models and local models, but uh, they seem to be the, the larger one. And the reason I say that is the Washington Post today talks about how they've revised their numbers down again. Uh, it just came out four hours ago. And I'm trying to get a handle on what this modeling is, because that's what we're basing a lot of this on, is what we expect. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like you to talk about the modeling and why the numbers at one point got revised upwards and then now got revised downwards twice. And, uh, and obviously, because we're getting more data in, but my concern is that they were using uh, Wuhan as a underlying uh, major data uh, starting point. And I'm wondering about that with regards to do we trust the Chinese government to release mm. full, total, and accurate information from what was going on over there? Um, because if we're based on modeling on that, it seems it might be flawed. But if you can just talk about uh, the HIPAA issue and mm -hmm. then the, uh, the modeling issues, right. I appreciate it. So HIPAA, fortunately, has not been a huge problem uh, for us so far. Our epidemiological processes are all designed to stay within, within HIPAA. Uh, that kind of goes, again, to you know, early on when we had suspect cases, how we wouldn't talk about them because they would have been HIPAA violations. But now our numbers are so large that as the numbers get bigger and bigger, the questions that are being asked are, are less impacted by, by HIPAA anyways. And so HIPAA has not been a huge problem. Um, uh, Let me ask you real quick about that so before we go on the other. And the reason I ask this is a number of people are saying that they have been told that there's somebody in their business, yep. in their company, that had uh, or has coronavirus. Yep. But the, the company, obviously, because they have a cannot release who that person is. Yep. And so that causes a great concern, especially among large companies, mm -hmm. where somebody says, what, did I meet that person? Do I know that person? Are they on my floor? And yep. they don't know who that person happens to be. And I don't think this is a case where we're treating this like a case of leprosy or anything like that, where everybody's like, oh, my God. Yep. Um, I don't think people are avoiding people because of it, mm -hmm. uh, in a sense that you know we know a lot of people who have it, and they're quarantining, and then they're back in with us. Right. Um, but I just yeah. That that so that at that level that it is a problem. We've we've heard many many stories exactly what you're describing, and at that level it it, it is a problem. Uh, but HIPAA is the law, and so we have to adhere uh, to the law. Um, but at that level, it, it absolutely is a problem. At, at our level, with the Lord, you know, looking at the entire community, it's it's not so big. But you're exactly right. I've heard I've had many many calls of people who are very stressed out by that, and um, uh, it's exactly as you described. But it's the law. You well, know. and stress to me reduces your immune system, so I'm always concerned about stressing people out. Yeah. Uh, but go on, please go on with about the so, modeling. The, the modeling. So modeling. Uh, we're, there are a lot of projections of when the peak will be, and a couple of comments about that is that the, the accuracy of those models, is, as you point out, is only as good as the information that's put into it. And so if we're basing a lot of those on the uh, information from Wuhan, uh, there is uh, a lot of suspect that the information coming from the Chinese government may not be as complete as uh, we, would, we would like. And so if it is inaccurate, if it is incomplete, then models that are based on that will be inaccurate. That's absolutely true. We also can look at Italy, and as more nations start uh, experiencing really high numbers, we'll have yet more communities. It'll be the same thing. How how honest and forthcoming are the those countries being with their data? Uh, from my standpoint, is I appreciate the projections, um, but I'm I'm operating based off of hard data. That's just the way I am, and so well, you know we'll we'll take every day's numbers and we'll look at how it changes our graphs and the trajectory of our graphs, and we'll go forward from there. Um, and the other comment I'd like to make is when we talk about the peaks, again, this, you know, about educating the public, when we get to the peak, the peak is not the end of the game. If anything, it's halftime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so a lot of people, well, when's the peak going to be? It's as if it's over then. It's not over then. Um, in fact, if you, and you, you all probably have already thought about this, but all these measures we're doing to slow down the progression, the spread of the virus mm -hmm. in order that we stay within the healthcare community's capacity, as we do that and it's successful, if we stop doing that, we're just going to have another spike. We just all we did was delay it. 
Well, well that's, yeah. a, that's an important point you talk about the peak. Uh, when you talk about the peak, we, we were just trying to make sure we didn't overwhelm the system. Right. Uh, but it's not to say that we're going to diminish how many people actually get coronavirus. That's In fact, exactly there's, right. uh, one of the models shows that pretty much eventually we'll all probably have coronavirus 19 yeah. because it's out there. And once it's out there, uh, it's that it's easily hard spread. Yeah. I mean, am I correct on what I, I mean? I didn't say it. Some other epidemiologist said it. And I just heard it. Mm -hmm. But it, it seems to be making common sense to me. That's so right. what we're really doing is sort of elongating this until, obviously, when we can get the vaccine. That's uh, right. And obviously, that's that's the end game to get the vaccine. Yeah, the, uh, the vaccine is the game changer. But in the meantime, we're still not talking. I mean, the peak happens. We're just trying to flatten that so we don't overwhelm our system, make sure the hospital beds aren't right. over capacity and all that. Yeah, when you look at those two graphs, the one with the high peak and the one with the lower peak, there's a concept that uh, the area under the curve. So if you, you look at the red and the blue, well, that, that amount of pigmentation is probably going to be the same. Yeah. It's just how is it laid out on the graph, right? Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Council Member Kamen. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Purse, thanks for answering all of our questions. Um, you know, Vice Mayor Pro Tem talked about your just absolutely pragmatic factual basis for answering all of this. And I really respect the city's approach in handling this and not handling this virus and not playing politics uh, when it comes to people's lives with this. So my question isn't in any way intended to be politically charged. It comes from a grave concern for um, women's health. And as you may be aware, uh, the state is currently preventing um, all abortions except for to save the life of a woman. Um, and they're prohibiting them and deeming them not medically necessary. Can you speak to the risk that that poses uh, to women who may be seeking help and now cannot access help in terms of what that can do uh, to mm -hmm. their lives and their safety, as well as um, the limits to access to health care that that prohibits? And are there other examples where the state may be blocking medically necessary uh, procedures that individuals may be seeking? Yeah, so you asked me a non-politically charged question. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, specific to a abortion, uh, the, the virus doesn't seem to have an, an impact. There's no evidence yet that there's tr vertical transmission from mom to the, to the child. Uh, so to, to that extent, uh, from OB care, and of course that may change, right? But at this point, there doesn't appear to be what we call vertical transmission. So I don't know that I really have a comment when it comes to abortion. Your broader question of social disparities and people having access to health care, uh, a lot of the hospitals have, you know, or, or clinics, um, there are a lot of specialty clinics like, you know, um, I'll, I'll pick on myself, but the one for, you know, male hair regrowth clinics and those sort of things, uh, those are clearly not medically necessary. But the, the challenge, the question comes into uh, things which are in what may be a gray area where some people feel are medically necessary and other, other people don't. And um, so I'll restrict my comments to about the progression of the virus, because that's my uh, area of expertise with this current is issue. And so anything that has anything to do with, you know, uh, infectious disease and treating the, those folks affected, that, those absolutely need to be open. We, we still have to keep in mind that, you know, heart disease is continuing. Uh, people's cancers are continuing to grow. And to your point, you know, women who are pregnant, those pregnancies continue to progress. And so we can't shut off everything and just focus solely on the virus because life is continuing. And so these are really challenging questions, yes. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Purse. Really appreciate it. And uh, um, well, we'll keep moving. So okay. thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, sir. Okay. That ends the, that ends the uh, mayor's report. Mm -hmm. And now we are turning to the consent agenda. So, Madam Secretary. Under the accept board category, item two has been removed for separate consideration. We need a motion for items three and four. Moved. Then moved and seconded on items three and four. Uh, discussion? In favor? Opposed? Granted. Under the purchasing and tabulation of bids, no items have been removed. Need a motion for items five through 14. Been moved and seconded. Moved and seconded. Discussion? Discussion? In favor, opposed, granted. Under the resolution category, item 15 needs a vote. Discussion on 15. Discussion on 15. In favor, opposed, granted on 15. 
under the ordinance category since your list was distributed. Item 19 has been pulled and will not be considered. Item 16 has been received and will be considered. Item 18 and 25 have been removed for separate consideration. Need a vote on the balance. Discussion, discussion, in favor, opposed, granted. This completes the items on the consent. On the matters removed, item two needs a motion. Second. It's been moved and seconded on item number two. Councilman Pollard on item number two. Thank you, Mayor. You all were quick on that. <laughs> um, looking at this item, I'm going down to the cover sheet in the MWBE participation. I know that we are approving uh, final award on this, but I do see that this vendor did not meet their MWBE goal. Um, I was told from OBO that the scope of work changed throughout the uh, course of the contract. And so it would be my request that Public Works or all the departments, especially OBO, track um, the participation when it comes to these contracts to see if these vendors are living up to the terms of their original agreement. Um, even if the scope of work changes and um, the current MWBEs may not be able to fulfill that work, then we need to see what measures are in place to get other MWBEs a part of the process so that they will um, make their goal. Uh, I know that we have this good faith clause in every uh, contract. I'm not a fan of the good faith clause at all, but I know it has to be there. But I think we need to be able to do a better job of tracking the uh, participation when it comes to our minority businesses uh, when we go through the process so that we don't get to the end of a, of a deal that's over a year in the process and they still have not met their goal. So based on that, I'm going to be voting no. Okay. I do understand public works did not uh, issue the, uh, the work that was originally envisioned. It was public works that decided that the work didn't need to take place. I can't place. hear you. It was public work. It was public works that decided that the uh, that the work uh, did not need to take place. It was a work order, so the work was not needed, and the 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 particular MWBE that was associated with that work, when that work wasn't needed, neither was uh, that MWBE the contract. So when the work is not needed, do we reassess the overall participation? because the goal is still the same. So are we, are we going to change the goal or are we going to look to maybe bring in other vendors that can do the work once the work yeah. is amended? Uh, right. But this was a work order. On a fixed contract, the answer is yes. But on a work order, no. That's the difference. That's the difference here. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion on item two? On item two? In favor? Opposed? Granted. Show Councilman Pollard voting no. Item 18 is an ordinance. We're on item 18. Councilmember Ellen Shabazz on, on item 18. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just want to, you know, talk to uh, Mr. Costello to just make sure that that this is not just cursory compliance. I need to make sure that these things are actually being done and see what other measures. Oh, no. Yes. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. We're on 18. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I just need more information. I'm sorry. Oh, I was ready. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. I just, I just want to get more information before I proceed. So on 18? Yes. Yes, yes. No, I thought she had already indicated that I had tagged it. Okay. Item 18 has been tagged by Councilmember Evan Shabazz. Yes. <clears throat> Okay, next item. Item 25. Now we're on item, 20, on item 25. <coughs> now, Councilmember Evans Shabazz on item 25. Do I start with that speech again? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I would just like to talk to uh, Mr. Costello to just make sure that so she, she I do want to, yes, thank okay. you, I'll just break it down, I want to tag it. Okay, item 25 is being tagged by Vice Mayor Pro Tem Castor Tatum and Council Member Evan Shabazz. 
Is this completes the items on the matter move matters held. Item 36 is in order. Uh, uh, she recognizes council. Oh. Council member Davis on item 36. Thank you, Mayor. Today's presentation, if you look at the monitor, <laughs> uh, the, no. Uh, Mayor, I just asked for a um, two week delay, friendly two week delay to just. <clears throat> look over a few things with with the property and um, as we move forward um, you've heard the motion by councilmember Davis it's been seconded any any discussion any discussion hearing none motion is granted this item is delayed for two weeks thank you mayor sure and colleagues okay that finishes the consent agenda for today we're going to start uh, the pop off with councilmember Travis hope I start a trend here I'm gonna pass Okay, Councilmember Cisneros. <coughs> I just broke your trend. You're a one-person trend. <laughs> um, I have some important information to share about a virtual presentation that will be.